On the 29th of June 2023, Zanaco hosted its first ever Innovation Summit, bringing together thought leaders and pioneers in the tech industry for insightful conversations. On this episode of Zanaco Unplugged, we will be diving into Innovate Her, a fireside chat on women leading in tech and pushing the envelope. This panel discussion is hosted by Chanda Chimeka Tongo, Zanako's Head, Client Solutions, Marketing and Communications. Thank you so much. To all of you who've joined us, you are welcome. We are so happy to host you this morning. So you know they always say technology is very male heavy. Well, the panel this morning is actually all female. So please allow me to introduce them. Evelyn Ngatia. Evelyn is an award-winning global thought leader in emerging technology and a fervent advocate for women in tech. Evelyn's career has spanned sectors such as corporate banking, energy, infrastructure, and manufacturing. This ultimately led to her establishment of Tekawatt Limited. Evelyn has joined us all the way from Kenya. A big hand, please. Mubanga Chilufia. Mubanga is currently the country director of Vayamo Zambia. She is a visionary technology enthusiast with a proven track record of overseeing transformative and engaging solutions. She possesses an innate ability to connect deeply with her consumers. With Vyamo, Mubanga is bridging the digital divide by providing information and content libraries in underserved communities using IVR technology. Mubanga, you're welcome. You. Regina Mutonga. Regina is the co-founder and director of Asikana Network. She has devoted her time to helping women realize their potential in the technology industry while rolling out digital literacy programs for children in various programs in schools. And, and she's very fast, as we can see. <laughs> <laughs> it is her hope that more women end up in tech industry. A big hand for Regina, please. <clears throat> Last but not least is Charity Mwanza. Charity is the CEO of Digital Pago, which is a subsidiary of Sanako. She is also the vice chairperson of the Payment Solution of Zambia. She has more than 20 years of experience in the payment and technology industries. A big hand for charity. <clears throat> Ladies, you are welcome. I am so excited to host you and to host this panel, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. So, Mubanga, how have you personally faced and overcome challenges as a woman in technology. I did mention earlier that technology is predominantly male-dominated. Yeah. But how have you managed? So before I answer your question, Chandra, let me tell you a bit more about what I do every day. So I'm the country director for an organization called Viamo. It's short for Via Mobile. So we connect hard-to-reach populations with development organizations because there are more hard to reach populations in Zambia and on the continent and just globally than those people that are connected, than you and I. So we reach that person who has got no TV, no radio, no newspaper, they can't read, they can't write. The only thing they have in their hands is a simple mobile phone that doesn't have internet, that doesn't even have airtime. And that's the majority of Zambians. And those are the people that we reach uh, with our technology. So follow me on LinkedIn and you'll get to know a bit more about what we do. But to answer your question, uh, like you have mentioned, it's a, it's a male-denominated uh, industry, uh, this tech industry. And some of the challenges that I've experienced, uh, you know, when I walk into a meeting, I can tell that, you know, the other person was actually expecting to see a male, 
And uh, for me, it comes with an extra challenge because they can't tell from the name on the email address uh, which one is the first name, which one is the last name. Is this male or female if they don't see my signature? But yeah, those are some of the things that I, you know, I face when I walk into a meeting for the first time. And so it sort of puts a lot of pressure on me because then I really have to deliver. This person already has a mind of, oh, it's a, it's a woman. I was expecting a man. And it gives me pressure to deliver. And uh, uh, I try my best to prepare as adequately as possible. And so that, you know, I, I, act, I actually even beat their expectations. So I know those are some of the things that even other women uh, face around here. Uh, but so I just, you know, I ensure that I overcome that by executing to the best of my capability. And I always win. So when you're given a stage like this, you are, you are on the limelight. You just make sure you shine as a woman. So that's how I overcome that. Fantastic. Yeah. And for sure, you are shining. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so how many women do we have in tech in the room? And how many of you have actually been mentored before? That's a few hands. We need more hands. So we'll talk a little bit about mentorship. So this question goes to Regina, and um, I think it ties in very well with what Mulanga talked about when she said um, there's pressure to deliver in this industry, and you have to meet quite a lot of expectations. But for you to do that, you need to be mentored, or you need to be coached. And I'd want to believe that the four of you on this stage have been through that. So Regina, this question is about mentorship and support systems. How important is mentorship in encouraging women to pursue careers in technology? I, I think, first of all, I'd like to say that if mentorship did not exist, I would not be on this stage. My, my very good friends and my co-founders, we founded Asikana Network. We are the product of, first of all, when mentorship is missing, and secondly, when it is found and we harness the mentorship. I met my co-founders and my friends when we were doing our, our, each of our first degrees. Um, and yes, we've had multiple since then. Uh, so we, we realized that we didn't have a lot of uh, female mentors you know, to look up to. We each had mothers who were very strong in their own fields, but they weren't women in technology. And so when we completed and uh, we went into society, as we call it, we decided to fix the problem that we ourselves were facing and we introduced Asikana Network, which doesn't only train, but also provides mentorship. And I feel that the importance of the mentorship shows itself in what women can achieve. Uh, first of all, in, in October, we'll be celebrating 10 years of Asikana Network. Wow. Um, oh, that's brilliant. Yes, I know, I, I, I don't look that old. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. But yes, 10 years, it's a milestone for us. We've been doing this for 10 uh, very exciting, very long years, but we did that mostly because we decided to fix the issue of mentorship by going to find the mentors ourselves. So part of the things that we've been doing as Asikana Network in the past decade is introducing women, such as the hands that I saw in technology right now, and encouraging them to mentor those ones that are coming because we want for us to be able to attend more meetings, more events like these ones, and have more hands up. I've been doing this for longer than 12 years, and I, I, I must be very honest, I'm still disappointed that every event I go to, that question is asked, how many of you are women in tech? And we have maybe six hands. I'm still disappointed that I still get to introduce myself as a, a software engineer in a room of other women who are maybe, maybe there's one or two other engineers. 10 years of doing this, I think that that's the importance of mentorship and, and why we should show that women can actually do it. Thank you for your response. And um, Regina, I'm also glad that the government is taking a step in this. As you've seen, a lot of STEM schools have come up and a lot of girls are being encouraged to enroll and to take part. So talking about uh, mentorship, so we've talked about the fact that you were mentored, Regina, right. but there's also organizations out there and we want to understand what an organization can do. So this question goes to Charity. So Charity, what steps can an organization take to mentor not only women, but the youth in general, in terms of technology and in terms of innovation? Thanks, Chanda. So let me answer that question by um, just explaining what we do at Digital Paper. So 
what we do is deliver digital solutions at the last mile. Now, when you look at delivering financial services at the last mile, there are many, many challenges. So I always look at people who are driving technology to that they need to have a certain mental state, right? I like what one author, uh, Tim Grover, you can, you can check him out. In his book, Relentless, he said these are cleaners. So the cleaners just want to get things done. And so in technology, we use um, technology as a tool to solve solution, uh, problems for the community. So the first thing that you get to see is for somebody delivering those solutions, they need to have a confidence, believe that they can deliver a solution. So, and that's where we start from. So organizations like ourselves, like many others, can put up uh, formal mentorship programs. These mentorship programs with an experienced uh, person is guiding uh, somebody that's new, provide uh, uh, certain skills, so that they can deliver that uh, solution that they have to. That's number one. Number two, the second one is you can have a, a buddy system. So where you, you, you pair somebody with uh, somebody that can help somebody navigate in the organization, how the culture is, uh, processes, you just help them settle down. And the buddy system doesn't necessarily have to be given to, to new ones in an organization, uh, but to even those that have been there. And women, um, young girls benefit a lot because then they can express themselves, ask questions, and just learn the ropes. But also what I've seen is it's very important to have evidence-based performance uh, systems. When you're driving technology, accountability is key. So when that is in place, it sort of acts as a support system, which then um, drives the, the productivity. Lastly, Chanda, what I would want to mention is something that's coming up um, recently. There is some research that's proving that it is very effective. It's called reverse mentorship. So a traditional mentorship is where you get an older person, more experienced, guiding, sort of a younger one. But in reverse mentorship, you get the young ones. So in technology, there's a lot of technology coming up. Um, social norms have changed. So the young ones are sort of providing mentorship to the so-called experienced executives. Because then they, they would say, okay, for example, when I was starting my IT career many moons away, so many things have changed. So when the younger girls come in the system now, they would tell you the social norms have changed, policies need to align to the way we look at things differently as young ones. So the reverse mentorship is very, very useful especially in technology, to get to align the new generation with the older generation and align processes that work. Thank you, Charity. And, and um, yes, a big hand for Charity, please. So I, I strongly um, agree with you when it comes to reverse mentorship. I uh, once had a young mentor who introduced me to TikTok. It didn't work very well for me. <laughs> Um, and I closed my account, but, um, <laughs> but I believe I still do need it, so I'll embark on it again. So my next question is on diversity and inclusion, and this is for, for Evelyn. Evelyn, thank you for joining us. I know you've flown in all the way from Kenya, um, and we're grateful to have you. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your organization and what you're doing in Kenya in terms of innovation. And then after that, you can just tell us what strategies an organization would need to implement um, in order to have diversity and inclusion in a workplace. One of our pillars for this conference is diversity. So we will touch a bit on, on diversity and inclusion. Over okay. To um, so, you know, Chanda had introduced me um, in terms of the company that I represent, which is Techawat Limited. So what we do is we provide corporate training, we provide um, thought leadership, we partner with marketing departments to provide thought leadership around emerging technologies. And we also uh, do strategy as well, strategy advisory. Now, um, all that we do is centered around the strategic skills of emerging technologies, because we believe technology, a lot of people fail to engage with technology because they feel it's too complex. 
um, it's male dominated. So people have all these mindsets around technology and the reasons why they do not engage with it. So for us is to come and simplify it in a way that is understandable, is high level, big picture view of where technology is going. So for example, we know that there's a digital revolution. We know that, you know, whatever you call it, industry 4.0 or emerging technologies, we know that there's IoT, there's artificial intelligence, there's, you know, blockchain and all these technologies. Um, but do we all want to get technical around these technologies? No. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck because they feel, okay, for me to understand blockchain, I really need to understand the nitty gritties of it. But what we say is it, look at it from a strategic viewpoint. Look at how industries are emerging, how industries are evolving and using these technologies from a high level perspective. And we always say, if you're a founder, a, a, you know, whatever, a leader, you don't need to understand the coding aspect of it because you can always get someone to get to do the technical aspect. But you need to understand how they're being used in manufacturing, how they're being used in agriculture, how they're being used in financial services across, mm. across the board. So I myself, um, in terms of my God-given purpose, is to facilitate the liberation of mindsets around emerging technology. So a lot of mindsets that we have, technologies for the young people, is for you know, men and all that. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, I also chair the board at the Women in Tech Alliance at the European Technology Chamber. So this is a um, chamber that is based in Germany, co-funded by the European Union. And it has, the essence is, you know, to enable European businesses to be able to use tech for the good of Europe, not just Europe, but across the world. Mm -hmm. And they have various pillars like Women in Tech, which I chair, but they also have digital transformation, uh, internet of things, smart cities, and all across the board is around uh, emerging technologies. Now, to answer your question, Chanda, around diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. um, one of the things is uh, there are very many diversity types, if you call it that, or diverse people. And we, we have addressed them. We've addressed, um, we've addressed gender. I think we're really getting there in terms of gender. But there's one area that often gets lost, and that's personality types. I think the split is like 50-50 when you look at introverts, extroverts. But when you look at the COVID time, when people were working from home, there were those people who are really thriving in that area. The people who are in, more introverted and like to, you know, process things, come up with creative solutions, and they need their space, not that buzzing, you know, um, the buzzing office. They need that space to, you know, charge their creativity and everything. So personality types, I feel a lot of times when you get onto the table, and um, especially with technology where we need innovation, we often leave them out because these are the people who need time to process. These are the people who need time to think about it and come up with a plan. So when you ask them, you know, on the spot, what do you think about this? They may not be able to give you a good answer, but if you give them time to go and think about it, they'll come back with a very good, innovative and creative plan. So that's one area. Um, obviously, there's women, and I feel like uh, on the women aspect, we've, we've, we've really tried, but on women in tech, we're not seeing a lot of um, representation. And let me give you some statistics, for example. Um, there's a report done by Patek which, which uh, details the African tech landscape and how uh, it's a venture capital report and how much venture capital is going towards the different you know, segments, uh, whether it's fintech, uh, whatever tech it is. And they say out of all the funding that went to African tech startups, only 13% went to female founded startups. So obviously there's that gap. Um, and when you look at even the tech rules, only 20, about 26% of women uh, of tech rules uh, are held by women. So what we need to do is how do we bridge that gap? And we need the men as allies to, to bridge that gap. We cannot do it as women on our own. We need the men to understand um, that aspect. So in terms of what are the strategies, I would say training. And when we look at what I mentioned before about strategic skills, we need to be strategic about the training that we're giving. Let's not focus on the technical aspects. Let's focus on the strategic aspects. And there are all others, uh, like, you know, we've talked about mentorship, we've talked about coaching. Coaching is a very, uh, is also another area which uh, holds uh, people accountable uh, in terms of what they're supposed to do. Um, awards and recognition for not just women in tech, but for, you know, the diverse uh, groups. Um, and just to understand that the digital revolution 
we are all working towards like the digital twin, for example, where everything will have a digital twin, where you have a factory has a digital twin, uh, your car, your connected car has a digital twin, etc., including us humans, which is very controversial. But when you look at it that way, that's where we are headed, and artificial intelligence is getting us there, Internet of Things is getting us there in terms of getting the data. So the key aspects for diversity and inclusion is to train the people, just to recap, is to train the people strategically, is to award and recognize the different aspects of people who are contributing in that area, but also being able to provide leadership around, uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Absolutely, and talking about um, having a, a, a twin in the virtual world, that's actually quite worrisome if you think about it. And, you know, we've seen lately videos of, of AI and you, you, you see an individual that you know and it's actually not them. So that, for me, is the scary part of, of, of AI and technology, and we're walking right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for <laughs> Evelyn. So my next question goes to both uh, Charity and Regina. So if you could just both answer this. Um, still on diversity and inclusion. So why is diversity important in, tech, in the tech industry, and how does it contribute to pushing the envelope? In our world, I think in, in, in the context, uh, diversity uh, for us means uh, various views, backgrounds, interests. You know, it doesn't matter where you come from, um, you can have a seat on the table. When you are trying to solve a problem, diversity comes in because you want a broader perspective. You want to have different views. Uh, people look at the same problem very differently. And then that uh, results into having very creative solution, uh, innovative products. And so the way I look at diversity, uh, for example, take four, four lenses, I would say four lenses. One is internal. Each person, there are certain things that are just unique about them that makes them them. And we say, okay, come as you are. You have value you can contribute to solving a problem. That's number one. The second one is, is external. There are certain things we can learn, change about ourselves. And so we then say, okay, if there's something you don't know, we can provide an opportunity for you to learn, expose you, so that you begin to change certain elements and position yourself to contribute valuably to creating a solution. The third angle would be um, something I would say organization. So, for example, in our organization, we drive cross-functional uh, working. Uh, looking at the same problem from different functions and units in an organization, together you then have a very holistic way you look at things. The, the last point is probably looking at how one looks at the world. You know, maybe the... the from a political end, from a religious end. Interestingly, we've had brainstorming sessions where just somebody looking at it from a political point of view influences how a product then is delivered uh, to market. So diversity uh, for me is very, very critical because then you get uh, a broader perspective, you get different interesting views, and just looking at life are very, very differently. Then when you talk about the envelopes, we, we actually push those envelopes every day. And what it actually means is, can we do things differently? So what I do differently in Lusaka is probably very different from somebody in Kasama. I didn't mention we deliver uh, solutions at the last mile. But they look at the same uh, financial products differently, and they contribute to how we then make improvements in our product. So, Chanda, to answer your question, diversity is just bringing everybody together, broader perspective, ideas, and solve the problem together. Regina, can we have your response on this? Yes. Uh, I took note of, of a few points, just three points, actually, of what I, I feel is the importance of diversity, especially when it comes to technology. The first one being that uh, it shows you different cultures and worlds. I think that we can all agree in this room that without technology, we wouldn't have been opened up to other cultures. 
the more you're exposed to technology, the more of the world you see without ever having a stamp in your passport. Um, many of us have been to many countries via TikTok and don't even have the stamps on our passports. It's because of technology. Mm. The second point that I noted was that it allows us to have a broader problem-solving mind. I'll give an example, and I'll, I'll give credit to my six-year-old daughter. I did not think of this. A few weeks ago, we went to see a movie at the mall, and she asked me, how do deaf people watch movies? And I had never thought about that, which took me into a rabbit hole of, of uh, trying to find out how do deaf people watch movies, because she must have at some point on her tablet seen that deaf people do see movies. But if they can't hear, then why are they in the cinema? And I found out that uh, in, in other countries where the cinemas are more developed, they have closed caption devices that sit in front of them that they can read as they are watching the movie. So it's, it actually sits in front of the screen so you don't miss the, the actual movie. And it got me to thinking, technology is a wonderful thing and it's so diverse because someone who either was suffering from this issue of not being able to hear what they're seeing on the television or someone who had a loved one that couldn't hear every time they were watching a movie thought to themselves, I need to fix that problem. And it reminded me just now of how, importance, how important it is to be diverse when it comes to technology because it makes you step into somebody else's shoes and be selfless because just because you can see, just because you can hear, doesn't mean that everybody else has the same ability. But can you not at least sit in their position and solve their problems or help solve their problems? The third and final point that I had noted down is something I talk about with my children all the time, the children that I teach, and it's critical thinking. The reason that diversity is so important when it comes to critical thinking is that it allows us to think of solutions for problems that we haven't even thought about. I'll give you an example. If you're planning on studying something like software engineering, you will notice that your teachers will always tell you, you need to be good at mathematics. And then you get to your first year of, of uh, sciences and you find that, depending on what school you go to, you find that either there's very little mathematics that you talked about, there's no simultaneous equations, or there's little mathematics. So then you start asking yourself, exactly why was Mr. Malinga telling me that I need to be good at math? But it's when you get to the third year and when you're thinned out from being 2,000 of you in first year and you're like 50 of you, then you realize why they tell you mathematics was important. It's, it's the logic. If you understand logic, you understand technology. If you understand the logic, the, the method of how the answer got to it, if you understand why one plus one got to two, you don't need to know the answer. I, and I think I speak for many, maybe there are even some teachers here. Many tutors will tell you the answer doesn't matter when it comes to the exam question. It's how you got there. The reason for that is just because I taught you how to get to oxygen using this method doesn't mean that when we have a problem similar to this one, you should only think about, oh, but this was the answer. And I feel diversity has a role to play in that critical thinking because we need to think of the way that we got to the one plus one. Not so much of the answer, but how exactly did we get there? And I feel that Every time that we're, we're teaching our children, it comes from, most of the times, what our children are portraying is what they're getting from their homes. Mm -hmm. So in your own homes, how exactly are you speaking to your children about diversity of technology? Yes, technology is bad for some parents, but are you also talking about the good parts of technology? Are you talking about apps like Duolingo, for example, that can teach even adults a language in a, in, in a mere six weeks, someone can learn a language. Are you teaching them to use TikTok for good? Mind you, the millennials, not so much, but something I've learned from the children that I teach, they're actually using, they're not using Google, by the way. We use Google. The younger generation are using TikTok to learn. And I've noticed it in the classes when I ask a question, they pull out their smart devices and they go to TikTok and ask the question to TikTok, not to Google. So if we cannot stop them from getting to that technology, you know, because we're in a diverse world, why then can we not change the narrative and say, we've accepted that we're living in a diverse world, let's use TikTok for good and you can actually learn something. And then you can curate the content to, to that. And um, yeah, I think those are my three main points on the diversity. Thank you, Regina. Thank you very much.
We've had very insightful discussions and uh, we, we are learning from you. So thank you to the ladies that we have on the panel. We have two more questions, so I will go to Mubanga. Mubanga, I know we started with you. Um, so your question is on um, technologies. So how can we all in the room, how can we stay ahead of the curve when it comes to technology and how it's continuously changing? How can we embrace new technologies? Yeah. So Chanda, I was going to say what everything says, uh, do an online course, network and all that. But I think before I say that, it's this, it's developing a growth mindset. It's in the mind. You know what they say about uh, a fish? Where does it uh, start? The rotting process of a fish starts from where? The head. Guys, if we don't take care of our, you know, our mental being, there, there's nothing that we can do to stay ahead of the curve. And so what I mean by developing a growth mindset is, you know, have uh, an intentional ability to learn and adapt to new technology. Like she said, uh, you know, she's learning from the children. Just have this intentional ability that you actually want to learn and stay ahead of the curve. And then you can now go to your networking, you know, and networking can be both physical and virtual. I think I was invited to this uh, workshop through a virtual, it was, it was a virtual network actually, and I was told to come over here. So do the virtual networking, uh, you know, there are massive open online courses that you can take uh, to, you know, advance yourself. So don't limit yourself, don't stay in your comfort zone. If you are, if you are an economist and you want to just stay in that space, you know, try to explore what else can we do with technology. And, and, you know, these are the things that I'm doing, you know, all the time, you know, there's no internet, uh, people can't read and write, but how can we reach them? They need information, they need to, you know, information is power, they need to improve their livelihoods, but they don't have access to all this. How do we do that? So it's in the mind, develop that growth mindset uh, to stay ahead of the curve. But like I say, there's a lot of resources online, there's uh, the massive open online courses online, you know, the strong networks, uh, get a role model. Uh, you, you might want to ask me questions if you see me on LinkedIn, and if I know, I can share with you. If you fail, get up and try again, you know. That's the, I think that's what I think. It all begins in the mind. You have to have that desire to learn, stay ahead of the curve, yeah. So, so that's my response, Chanda. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for your response. And developing a growth mindset is very critical. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I usually tell the, the mentees that I mentor that learning is a must. You need to continuously learn. And I agree with you online. There are so many courses yeah. that anyone can embark on. So please, ladies and gentlemen, if that's something we need to do, let's, let's learn. So our last question goes to Evelyn. So Evelyn, how can we contribute to the development and advancement of emerging technologies? Um, no, that's a very good question. And I think what she's addressed, mindset is so key, it's so important in this era, because a lot of people have mindsets that are fixed, that are limiting, and so we have to really look at that. Mm. But in terms of developing um, and advancing emerging technologies, I would, I would put it into, into two categories. There's one, you need to understand your purpose, your God-given purpose and to digital leadership. Mm -hmm. So when you think about everybody in this room was created for a reason, God created you for a reason. And it's your, the, the, it's your responsibility to understand what you have been called to do. Um, that's, that's, that's the unique thing that you have, or that you carry, that everyone else needs. So I would challenge you to actually figure out what that is. And if I can just give you a brief history about um, myself, is that I was, uh, before founding TechAwat, I was actually in the banking industry, in corporate and investment banking. And um, it's, I was at a point where I felt unfulfilled and I had to do a search um, in terms of engaging a coach as well to make, help me to get to that point where I am fulfilled or that life has meaning. And um, those, it was through a lot of prayer, but I also had a coach who actually led me through that process. And I think one of the things that the coach said, the very, one of the very few uh, engagements that we had, and she said to me, you know when you talk about your job, you're just like, 
meh, you know. But when you talk about emerging technologies, your face lights up. So that's the power of the coach. And she just kept drawing that and drawing that and drawing that into where I found myself writing a book, uh, writing articles, and she held me accountable in terms of visibility, put yourself out there, put your thought leadership out there. And as soon as I started to do that, then people would take notice and, and, and it just, you know, it just went on and, and on and on uh, up to where I am. And I found myself, by God's grace, in very influential places and positions. And it can only be God, but you've also got to connect to your purpose. Because when you connect to your purpose, it unlocks the favor, it unlocks doors just open for you because you're operating in your... It's like you actually need to align. So I want to challenge you with that. And the other thing is, there's this guy that I am really inspired by. He, he's, he's the founder of, it's called MindBank AI. MindBank AI is like an app where, um, at this point, it's still manual. Where you, it's like a journal. So how are you feeling? So you're journaling sort of your, your feelings and your emotions. Um, but it's more so like a mental health kind of app. And when you put in whatever you're feeling, it will ask you a list of questions. So depending on how you answer, there's a dashboard that would show you what your mental health or emotional health looks like, you know? And if there's anything that needs... So it would be easy to pick out things like depression, things like, you know, when your mental health is off. And when you think about that technology and where we are going in terms of, like, you know, Elon Musk and what he's doing Neuralink, imagine if those two came together, where all you need is a chip implant in your brain and it picks up because emotions are neurochemicals. So if it was to pick up that data, and now you don't even need to journal or put in any manual entries, then it would pick up when your emotional health is off, and you can actually nip it in the bud. Now, why I'm giving this example is that the guy who's actually developed that has a background in psychology. So that's what he studied. So think about when you're connecting to your purpose, what is that foundation that you have? For example, in this case, psychology then how can you use emerging technologies to better your, what you're called to do? So if it is a psychology, how then are we using AI or how are you using whatever it is, IoT, to actually layer on top of your, of your foundation, okay? So I think that is very key because we are all going to be techies. I put it in quotes because we're not really techies, but across the board, across functions, whether you're in marketing, you're in legal, you're an accountant, um, we are all having to learn about tech. Mm -hmm. So it's all about tech and what, can you, what is your foundation and what are you layering on top of that foundation using technology to bring solutions to the world that the world needs. So number one is understand your purpose, what you are called to do, because you cannot um, give from an empty cup. So feel yourself first before you can give others. The other thing I would say how we would advance this is digital leadership. Take on leadership roles, um, like, like, like you know, what I said before. Put out your thought leadership. What do you know? Say you're an accountant in a certain department, and historically you're not being considered as a tech person. Um, but why, why not? Because you can be the one that is you know, setting the standard for your accounting department to actually embrace these emerging technologies. But we won't know what you know until you put it out there. Mm. So I would challenge you, put your knowledge, everything that you know, if you're an accountant and you're championing this technology, put your knowledge out there. You know, uh, marketing team, I challenge you as well. Have your internal thought leaders who, you know, put out content around um, what they know and how, you know, that is being championed. When I think about digital leadership, I also think about um, like, a, you know, in line with the mindset, the limiting mindsets that people have. There's something in psychology they call exposure response. So this is where, you know, like you have a fear and um, you gradually expose yourself to that fear until and you manage or are very intentional about how you respond to that fear so that over time you overcome that fear. So that's exposure response. Now use it in the area of technology. A lot of people are fearing to use technology because they think either it's male dominated, so this is for the women, they feel like it's male dominated, or they feel it's for the young people, so this cuts across whether you're male or female. Or other limiting mindsets that people have, expose yourself to those things, put yourself out there. You may not be perfect uh, when you start out, but as you continue to grow and gradually face that fear, you will overcome and you will become a digital leader, which is all what we need to be in this digital revolution. 
So in a nutshell, I would say, in terms of how do we advance, first under, go inward, understand yourself and what you bring to the table, get the necessary skills, they don't have to be technical skills, get strategic skills, and then be a leader, put yourself out there, you know, shape discussions. When policies are being discussed, where are you? Put yourself, put your hand up, you know, where people are looking to promote. And, and my journey is, I was not, I've not done IT, I've not done computer science, but I find myself in the tech, and I say my space is the strategic space, so I'm not a techie. So find your space, find your calling, and thrive in that area. We're all called to be digital leaders. Let us embrace, even if you're a lawyer, you're a marketer, you're also you know, a, a legal tech person, you're also a marketing tech person. So let's embrace the digital leadership in this era. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Evelyn. And I think you've summarized it very well. So our takeaway, ladies and gentlemen, in all your different spaces, in all your different sectors, you can be a tech leader. So let's just take that away with us. Ladies, thank you so much. It's been an honor hosting you on this panel. And I'm very sure that we've all learned. So a big hand to the ladies as we head off the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.